Welcome everyone, and our next speaker is Luke Spademan, and he's going to be talking about pet made or how to run beautiful pet infected. So let's all welcome Luke. Thank you. I'm just quickly going to mention that um, my slides aren't made for this resolution. I forgot to fix that, but so if they look bad, bling it on that and not my design skills. Um, so, quickly about me. My name is Luke Spademan. I'm a self-taught Pythonista. I just say that so you know that I probably have holes in my knowledge because I've just learned from the internet. If I get something wrong, please let me know. It's always good to prove knowledge. Um, I've been programming for about five years in Python, um, and I've had to read and work on some badly written code before, and it wasn't fun. So I'm gonna hopefully try and help you not contribute to that problem. So, to understand what beautiful code is, we need to know what beautiful is. And according to the Oxford English Dictionary, it's something that senses the mind aesthetically. No, yeah, that's what it says. Um, so then, what's beautiful code? So it's code that looks nice and is easy to read. Um, and that mainly comes from having consistent formatting. And the main thing that Pepe talks about is having your code consistently formatted. It doesn't really matter how it's formatted, which I'll give you some rules of how you should format it, but be consistent with what's already there. That's the main thing. Um, so we have things called style guides, and they define how code should be formatted within a particular scope. So that might be within a certain organization or within like a specific project within an organization. Um, I say most projects have them. I haven't worked on most projects. I assume a lot of projects have them. If not, they probably should. If you work on a project that doesn't have one, maybe you can inquire about getting one made. Um, because it's all about consistency, having code that's easy to read. Um, some languages have them, and Python has one. It's called Pepe. Um, so what's the point in a style guide? It tells people how their code should be formatted, and that allows them to make their formatting consistent with everyone else in the project. So, Pepe. PEP stands for Python Enhancement Proposal. There's hundreds of PEPs about suggested language features and all sorts of things. PEP8 is the eighth or maybe ninth PEP. I don't know where the numbering starts. Um, but PEP8 is all about consistency. In near the beginning, it says it's all about consistency. If you get one, from, one thing from this talk, it's all about consistency. And consistency on as wide a level as possible but it's most important to have consistently locally to a file or even a function within that file. Pepe has several sections which we're going to cover. Um, so we'll start off with code layout. So we're going to, yeah, indentation. We've got the tabs versus spaces debate. Pepe says use spaces. Um, so don't hate me for that, that's Pepe. Um, you should use full spaces. You should never mix tabs and spaces. I think the Python interpreter will shout at you if you mix tabs and spaces, so don't do that. Um, and you should only ever use tabs if it is for consistency reasons. And because you shouldn't mix tabs and spaces if there are already tabs in the project, stick to using tabs. So some good examples of how you should indent your code. So if you have, um, if you're calling a function or whatever, you should, if you have arguments on the same line as the opening delimiter. Arguments on the second line should line up with the opening delimiter. Um, I find with these, looking at the examples is the best way to understand how it should look. Learning actually what the rules technically mean doesn't really have much. Um, and you see here, if there's code that's being indented, you should indent all of your arguments by, or, um, by two indentation levels so it doesn't get mixed up with the code underneath. Um, <coughs> And yeah, hanging indents, you should add an extra level. So we'll see some similar examples here that are just the same but done wrong. Um, so you can see here we aren't lined up with the opening delimiter and it can be confusing trying to read where all the arguments are. Um, and here you can't tell what's arguments and what's code. So don't do that. Then the next thing in PEP8 is all about line length. And lines should be no longer than 79 characters. Um, we'll get on to why that is in a minute. And if you have something like a doc string or a comment that has no logical like purpose in the actual code, you should limit it to 72 characters. 
um, because you're more flexible with how you can format that. And that comes from when people have editors that are 80 characters wide and can't be any wider, and you want to stop um, wrapping of code onto the next line. Um, if you have line breaks um, when you have binary operators, if you have the line breaks after the binary operators, it can be quite confusing to see which operator refers to which item in the list of things in the expression. So you've got your IRA deduction, but it's actually the negative sign on the line above at the very end that applies to the IRA deduction, and it can be quite hard to read up and see that. So a better way of formatting that would be like this, and you can clearly see which operator corresponds to which item. Um, but you should be locally consistent. Don't mix which type you use. But for new projects, you should choose the latter option. But if you're using both options, that could get really confusing because you, your eye will learn where to look. But you should always, for new projects, use the better option. Um, blank lines and files. So if you have any function or class declarations, they should all be um, surrounded in <coughs> two new lines. Methods within the class should be surrounded by one new line. Um, you can add new lines places for logical separation of code, but that should be spare, used sparingly. And within your functions, you can have new lines for logical separation, but again, there shouldn't be too much of that. Files should be UTF-8 encoded. Your editor should do that for you anyway, but that was section F8, so I thought I'd throw it in. Um, when you import modules into your code and libraries and stuff, you should import should all be on the same lines unless they're part of the same package. So if you import time and you import OS and you import SIS, they should all be on separate lines. But if you're importing multiple things from time, that can all go on the same line. You should start off with your standard library imports, then any modules you've installed separately, and then stuff local to the application. And you should use absolute paths where it's possible, because if you don't have absolute paths, that can be ambiguous. And a big thing in Python is ambigu ambiguity isn't good, because, that, yeah. Um, and wildcard imports, so if you say from time import star, you have no idea what's actually being imported. That can be confusing to read, and also, I don't think it's like best efficiency-wise. In Python, we have single quotes and double quotes. It doesn't matter how you use them, as long as you pick a rule and you stick with it. Again, it's all about consistency. Um, and white space is in statements. So white space, that's unnecessary. I'm going to show you some examples of how to have white space that's logically unnecessary and, why, and how you shouldn't have stuff. So in the first example, or in the second example, we have white space inside the parentheses, brackets, and braces, and that's not how it should be done. Um, I think the first example does look a lot neater, and it takes up less line width, which we limited to 79 characters. Um, when you have a tuple in Python, if it's got one item in it, you have to have a comma at the end, you shouldn't have a space after that comma. Um, with the commas, semicolons, and colons, it's like in normal English, you should have white space on the right hand side, but not on the left hand side. Um, apart from in slices, because in a slice, a colon acts as a binary operator, um, so it should be treated in that sort of way. So here you can see, sometimes we don't have spaces on either side of the colons. Um, with these, it's, I think it can be hard to memorize how everything should look. So I'm going to get on later into how you can not need to remember this. Um, but again, just familiarizing yourself with how it should look and how it shouldn't look. I think it can be quite obvious if something looks wrong. Um, but knowing how to do it is a bit harder, but again, I'll get onto that later. Um, when you have a function call, you shouldn't have a space after the name of the function and for parentheses for the argument list. And again, it's the same with slices and um, indexing. You shouldn't have spaces before the parentheses there. Some people think the second option here looks better because it's all lined up nice and neatly. However, when reading your code, it's hard to trace along to see which value goes to which identifier. It's much easier to, to read in the first one. The second option might look nicer, but actually it's less functional. When you're trying to do your work, you need to clearly see 
what goes with what. Um, and trailing commas, they can be useful when you're using version control. So, yeah, but only use them when you um, have each item on a separate line. So if we see here in version control, if you added a new item to the first list, you only want to see that there has been a change to that new line you're adding. But if there wasn't a trailing comma, that would appear in your um, change log, and not in your change log, in your diffs. Um, but on the second line, because it's all on the same line anyway, that line would already be appearing in the diffs. So it doesn't have as much, it's not as important. And comments. Comments can be useful, but sometimes they're just a bit obvious, and that adds the necessary distraction. You know, you don't want to read a comment and be like, oh, that's pointless, that taught me nothing, that's wasted time, and it clutters up the screen, it only adds comments, if they're actually useful. Um, and doc strings. If it's a single line doc string, the closing quote marks should all be on the same line as the rest of the single line. But if it's a multi-line doc string, you should have the closing um, quote marks on the next line. There's loads of information in PEP257 about how you should format doc strings. Uh, I won't get into all of that now because we won't have time. And there's some stuff about naming conventions I want to quickly go over. So if you have a lowercase l, an uppercase o, or an uppercase i, they look like ones and zeros and some typefaces. It can be very confusing. Ambiguity isn't good when it comes to code. So don't use those as single letter variable names. All your identifiers should use standard ASCII and no fancy emojis or anything. Um, probably, I'd say that's down to edit editor support, but also it's like, why would you have emojis and like identify that? No, just don't do that. Um, modules and packages should all have lowercase names. Modules can have underscores in their names for readability purposes. Packages shouldn't have underscores in their names. Um, classes should use camel case or caps word convention. Expe exceptions in Python are classes, so should also use the same convention as classes, so camel case or caps words, however you want to call it. Functions and variables follow the same convention, and that's lowercase with an underscore. People refer to that as snake case sometimes, which I like because it's Python and it's like snake case. Um, when you have um, instance methods in a class, you should use self is the first argument every time. And if you have class methods, you should use CLS every time. Um, you should use the function naming conventions for method names and instance variables within um, an object. And you can add one leading underscore to make something private so it's not accessible outside of um, one scope. Up or down, depending on which way you're looking at it, I suppose. Um, all cap, so we'll use all caps for constants. If you're saying pi equals 3.141, whatever, that should all be in uppercase so you know it's constant. And there's a lot of rules here we've talked about, and it can be hard to remember them, hard to know what you need to do. I could have gone into a lot more detail with all of these, but we wouldn't have had time. So you can use something called a linter. And a linter will check for formatting issues and, in some cases, pep violations. And they'll shout at you. They'll tell you you're wrong. Um, and you can put them in your CI, or you can put them in your um, in your version control when you go to push stuff or make commits. You can have it so it automatically runs linters to check your code is properly formatted. So you don't need to remember all of these rules I've just mentioned. It will tell you what you've done wrong at the time. Um, there's loads of these. Um, but two popular ones are PyLint and Flake8. What I found is some linters are more relaxed than others, and some are a lot more strict. So if you use multiple, you're more likely to pick up on everything. Um, so here is some badly formatted code. Some of the issues here are you shouldn't use foobar or bas as identifier names in your code, um, because they're normally used as placeholders, and it's probably like, don't do it. Um, Remember in PEP8 said you need two new lines on either side of your function declarations, and we don't have white space on either side of that binary operator. And we're also missing the, um, the, an argument in our call to foo. And if you run pylint against this code, it will tell you everything you've done wrong, 
tell you where you've done it wrong, where you've done it wrong. And these are quite, these actually tell you what you've done quite well, so they are quite readable. And also the missing doc strings. Um, I think I forgot to mention, I think it was on the slides, that you should have doc strings in all public um, functions, methods, and classes. So a lot of these things, like with the slices, it's hard to memorize the rules. And you probably, well, I get it wrong a lot. And it can be hard when you're writing the code to remember how should this look. Um, so we have some auto formatters we can use that will automatically reformat your code to um, comply with PEP8. And there's a popular one called Black, which is the uncompromising code formatter. So it formats your code so you don't have to. Um, it's still in beta, and it's not perfect but it does most things. A lot of people have said they don't like it for certain reasons. I personally really like it, but some people don't. Um, and it's got edited integration, so you can have it, so when you save your code, it automatically reformats everything to be as compliant as possible. Obviously, it can't fix things like missing doc strings or using foobar bars as identifiers, but it does the actual um, structure of the code. It can fix all those issues, the first section in Pepe. So it can fix any issues with white space um, and trailing commas and things like that. So if we run black against that badly formatted code we saw earlier, it's added the white space on either side of the plus sign, and it's added the two new lines in between the function declarations. But obviously it's not fixed the doc string issues or anything like that, because that would be impossible. And it doesn't fix everything, it's not perfect, but it works quite well. So to recap what we've covered, Consistently formatted code is easy to read. Your brain will work out ways of reading the code efficiently. If it's inconsistently formatted, it can't do that. Code is read a lot more than it's written. Other people who aren't you will have to read your code. So it's important that it is readable. It will make your coworkers happy if they can read your code easily. And I think it's important to have happy coworkers. Um, your organization or project you're working on might have a style guide. If so, you should follow it. If not, the language might have one. And if they don't have a style guide for your project, you can inquire about how you could, like one being made, so new people to the project know how they can format their code. And they can write all these formatting rules into their editors so their code will automatically be formatted in the same way as the rest of the code base. PEP8 is Python's style guide. You should read it, maybe. You don't have to. Linters will tell you what you've done wrong. Black will fix a lot of the issues for you. But it is, it's a good read, it's well written, and it's not, like there's some specifications that you read them and you're like, wait, what did that just say? But PEP8 is filled with lots of examples, it's fairly readable, and there's lots of guides online on how to understand it, but you don't need to read it. You should use a linter, I think that's the two things to take away from this talk mainly. Number one, be consistent. Number two, use a linter. Um, they'll tell you when you format your, your code wrong or incorrectly, and they mean you don't have to remember the formatting rules. They're highly customizable, um, so you can configure what the class is right and wrong and tell them to stop complaining about certain issues that you don't actually care about. Um, use the formatter, maybe. They're not for everyone. They don't catch everything, but they do work. Um, I'm Luke Spademan, and you can find me like on a few places on the internet. And we've got about five minutes for questions, if anyone has any. Thank you. Are there any questions about black formatting? Is writing nicer, more readable code? So, I, I, I personally am one of the persons that like black. Yeah, I know, I'm sorry. Um, so, how would you normally use black in your projects? Would you recommend people having it in their CI, CI workflows, or as a frequent hook, or how to use it? Or why not using it? I personally use black um, with editor integration, but I think you I've seen people use black before, so when people commit code it's in the CI and it will automatically reformat everything and tell them if they haven't formatted stuff um, to the specification that you have. But I think that's something that the people at the top of the project have to sort out. You can't just go and do that. I think for you personally, it's useful to have it in your editor. So whenever you save, it reformats everything. 
Because otherwise, if it's like when you go to commit your code, stuff gets reformatted, you'll like the layout will change after a while and you won't be familiar with how it's all formatted. But if it's on save, I know I'm constantly saving my code, like I write a word and then I save it. Um, so it gets reformatted automatically and you almost don't notice it happen. So you don't have to re-familiarise yourself with the way it's laid out and you only see the code laid out in the way that makes most sense. But I think if you've got people on your team who aren't following these rules, it could be useful to have it in your CI or use linters in your CI so your CI builds will fail if people don't follow the rules. Um, but I say for you personally, put it in your editor, it's not hard to do. There's plugins for it for most popular editors. There's a lot of documentation on how to set it up. I think it's, that's the way to do it, yeah. Thank you. Oh. I turned it off, of course. Um, I think I yeah, I just shout out loud. Um, so, what's the what's the objection people have to black over? And is there an alternative? Just, I mean, I've not really used black, but I heard people have objections about it. I don't know what they are. For alternatives, I think there is another alternative. I'm not 100 percent sure what it's called. I'm. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, there's one called Yap. Yeah. I'm not familiar with it. Um, I think some people on Twitter were saying the issues with black were they use single quotes, but black formats everything to double quotes. But that's really easy to change, I'm pretty sure. It's just like um, black is highly customizable. I think that's easy to change. Is it not? Okay, that's not easy to change. I'm just <laughs> at confirmation. Um, people don't like it because of the quotes issue. Um, and the line length issue. And the line length issue. But then you, you can, can change. change. But you can, okay, you can change the line length stuff. I think. But black is open source. If you have issues with it, go fix it. Um, now I think it's mainly the quote mark thing. Um, I don't really have an issue with it, but other people do. I mean, it's small stuff. But if you know the rules already and you're using a linter, you can fix stuff yourself. But people don't like But it's quite quick. So I also use auto formatters for HTML and stuff, and they can be quite slow sometimes. Well, the ones I use. Um, but then black, I find, can be pretty quick at fixing stuff. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Sorry, the I'll battery died. Yeah, yeah. uh, so, do you have any personal opinions that aren't covered by PEP8 about how to write beautiful code? Or do you just say PEP8 is fine, it's perfect? So you're saying, do I have issues with what PEP8 says, well, I'm what I do instead, or do additional to, rules to add? An additional rule, something, something that upsets you that you want everyone to fix. Um, not that I can think of off the top of my head. If you're still using Python 2, that does upset me and you should um, move to Python 3. But no, formatting wise, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that Pep 8 doesn't cover that drives me mad. Yeah, any other questions? Are there any known examples where Black has broken a piece of code? Um, I don't think so. Yes. No. Yes. Oh. oh, yes. Oh. Oh. Uh, if you do a SQL alchemy, um, SQL alchemy overrides the equal equal operator, so you can uh, uh, say that a column equals equals true, and that's perfect uh, for SQL alchemy. There is another way to write it that I never remember. But if you do equal equal true, your code works, you commit it, black goes over it, says it should be is, it changes that, and breaks the working code. Uh, that's one example I ran into. I'm pretty sure there are others in the, along the same lines where operators are being uh, overridden and things like that. So if this is being recorded for the sake of that, apparently black can break SQL alchemy code. If you use equals equals in SQL alchemy, black will fix that to be an is. I say fix, it should be an equals equals for SQL alchemy. So that's an area where it doesn't work. So I suppose that'd be an area where not to use it. But black is open source, you can open an issue. Um, but Thank stuff you. takes a while to get fixed. Thank you for mentioning that. We were done, I didn't know. And I believe we have another question at the back. When you have um, name violations, do you use rope or anything or some other refactoring tool to resolve it? I don't know. Um, but I think with naming violations, I'm not familiar with rope, which you just mentioned, but 
if it fixes, I so is that like if you don't follow the formatting rules for name for naming conventions, it will fix it to follow the naming convention. Uh, if, you, if you follow not follow the rules for a naming convention and then you use that name in multiple places, you uh, replace it. And oh. Replace it actually being used. No, I'm not familiar with that or how it works. No. I will, okay. I'll have a look at it later. Sounds interesting. Were there any other questions? Okay, thank you for your time.